Welcome back to our four-part series on Mashiach, the Messiah, and the Messianic Redemption. So far, we've learned about the basic principle of Mashiach and the Messianic era. And also, last week, we touched on who is Mashiach? The million-dollar question in Judaism, though, is when is Mashiach coming? The Talmud teaches, as you can see in source number one, that Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi, who was a great Talmudic sage, asked Mashiach himself, when are you coming? Because Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi was such a spiritual individual, he was able to have that perception of what was going on in the heavens. So he used the opportunity to ask Mashiach, when are you coming? So Mashiach responded to him, today. So Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi waited and waited the day is going by, and as the sun is set, he is very disappointed. Mashiach didn't come. So he uses the opportunity to ask Elijah the prophet, why didn't Mashiach come like he promised? He said he was coming today. And so Elijah answered back, today, if the Jewish people will hearken to his words and prepare for him coming. If you take a look at source number two, there is a preordained date that Mashiach's coming, and it is a heavily guarded secret. The only thing written about that date is that it will happen in its time. God will eventually send the Messiah, whether the world is ready or not. Yet the collected merit of the Jewish people can usher him in earlier. So the idea is that there is a preordained date that no matter what, Jewish, uh, Jewish people, the world community is ready, ready or not, here he comes. But if the world community is ready earlier, then Mashiach will come earlier. The Talmud speaks actually harshly about those who try to calculate the redemption who try to work out mathematically or find codes in the, in the Bible as to when, when that end date will actually be. Why does the Talmud speak harshly about those who try to calculate the exact time? Well, there's a few reasons for that. Number one, errors would cause national disappointment. Imagine you get everybody ready and excited that Mashiach is coming this and this day or this and this week, and then he doesn't show up there's national disappointment and despair, and people will lose faith in Mashiach's actually coming. Another reason why the Talmud was against calculating an exact date was because it gives likelihood for false messiahs to declare themselves, look, I'm the messiah. It said it was foretold that it will come in this and this a day, this and this week, so I, I'm here to, I'm, I'm here to, to present myself. So, Number one, because it would cause national disappointment. Number two, because it gives opportunity for false messiahs to present themselves. And another reason is that we learned earlier, the Rambam, the famed medieval sage Maimonides, says that it is a mitzvah, it is an obligation to await Mashiach's coming every day. So if a person has in their mind that Mashiach is not coming toward, till such and such a day, he won't wait for him today because in his mind, Mashiach isn't coming until next week or next month or next year. So the idea is that we have to wait for Mashiach's coming every day and not make specific forecasts as to when Mashiach is coming. Some say, though, some of our Jewish sages say that this prohibition doesn't apply nowadays, that it only applied to earlier generations. Why did it only apply to earlier generations? Because in earlier times, if they heard that Mashiach wasn't coming for another thousand years, two thousand years, or three thousand years, it would cause anguish that, the, that Mashiach was so far off. But now that the world is getting closer, on the brink of redemption, there's no prohibition at all. The Malbim, a famed 19th century sage, says uh, an enlightening analogy. He says, imagine you have a father and son who are traveling a long distance. At the beginning of the journey, the son asks the father, when are they going to arrive at their destination? Dad, are we there yet? 
as they near the town, the son takes the same question, the, the son asks the same question to the father. This time the father gives an answer and said it'll just be a short while longer. The, the analogy is pretty clear. So too as the redemption nears, right, the, the idea of forecasting will become, things will become more apparent in the world that Mashiach is ready to come. The truth is that the redemption is an unfolding process, one that we can even see traces uh, unfolding right as we speak. The Chafetz Chaim, a famed 20, early 20th century sage, said that even a blind person can see that we are on the brink of Mashiach. All signs indicate that he's not far off. A contemporary scholar, Rabbi Moshe Sternbach, says that exile is nearing an end. We have been told that the year 6000 is going to be when Mashiach must come, the year 6000 on the Jewish calendar. And he writes, the conditions for him coming have already been fulfilled. The Lubavitcher Rebbe, countless times throughout his leadership, announced and publicized that Mashiach is imminent. The sages laid out, a laid out a map of how world history would unfold from the days of Adam all the way until Mashiach would come. The world is described in the Torah as being created in six days. The sages draw a parallel between these six days and 6,000 years of world history that would conclude in, a, in, in Mashiach coming. In other words, that just as the world was created in six days and God rested on the seventh day, so too the world will exist for 6,000 years and the world will experience a time of rest following that. An eternal rest, an eternal Sabbath known as the year of Mashiach. If you take a look in text number three, you'll see it laid out clearly. In the Talmud, the first 2,000 years from, the, from Adam until the year 2000 after Adam were days that were known as the, the era of nothingness, the years of nothingness, because then the world was in a, a semi-chaotic state. You had world in upheaval going through the flood of Noah, through the Tower of Babel, and through the Jewish people being subjugated in Egypt, Egyptian slavery. The year, the year 2000 to the year 4000 on the Jewish calendar were known as the years of Torah. And what that means is not only was the Torah given during that time, but both holy temples also stood during that time. It was the year where Torah and the Jewish people were very powerful. It was in their, in their crux. Then the year 4000 to the year 6000 on the Jewish calendar is known as the era of Mashiach, the years of the Messiah because Mashiach, this was the, the time period, this is the time period, which is most apropos for Mashiach to come at any moment. And so they, the sages of the Talmud give various omens that will alert the Jewish people that Mashiach's coming is very near. Take a look in text number four, and you'll see that it begins with a bit of a downward spiral. The downward spiral of events begins with large segments of the Jewish community being unfamiliar with their roots. People will no longer have respect for authority, and there will be no one who can provide correction. Wisdom shall become putrid, truth abandoned, the government will become godless, the academies places of immorality, and the pious denigrated. So along with these sort of negative predictions, come also some positive predictions as well. Besides the signs of despair, the sages offer some positive signs that the imminence of Mashiach is right away. Number one is that there will be a, renew a renewal in Torah study, that the far-reaching uh, dissemination of Jewish mystical tradition will have flowed throughout the world, and also the opening of the gates of wisdom above and the wellsprings of wisdom from below. The wisdom from Rebbev refers to the promulgation of Torah uh, at a whole new level and the, the, wellsprings, the opening of the wellsprings of wisdom from below refer to marvelous discoveries in science and advancements in technology. One of the most interesting uh, and important texts you could see in text number five um, is, is from the Zohar. The Zohar teaches that our oral tradition teaches that the world as we know it will last for 6,000 years, as we said earlier. 
Each millennium, will parallel, each millennium parallels a day in creation. That's described in the Torah. In the seventh millennium, which corresponds to the Sabbath, the universe will go into a period of Sabbath, of, of, uh, of, of renewal. One interesting thing that it says is that 600 years into the sixth millennium, which would be the year 5600 on the Jewish calendar, that the gates of the supernal wisdom from above will open. They, they will open together with the wellsprings from below. This will begin a process which will prepare the world for the seventh generation. Now keep in mind, the world right now, we're on the, in the Jewish calendar, we're in the year 5777. And what that means is that on the cosmic clock, we are very near to the year 6000. One of the things that, that happens in my home before the Sabbath, and one of the things that the Zohar predicts, is that no matter what time Shabbos starts, no matter what time the Sabbath comes in, whether it's 5 p.m. or whether it's 8 p.m., it's a rush in a Jewish home in the afternoon. Doesn't matter if it starts earlier, which could understandably be a lot of rush. You have to come home early from work and set up everything up very quickly. But if it's starting 8, 9 o'clock at night, somehow, magically, it's still, it, the house is a bustle and every, everything is in a mode of rush. So too, says the Zohar, that as we near the year 6000, on the, which is on the cosmic clock Friday afternoon, things will begin to speed up. And that means that Torah dissemination will increase exponentially, as will science and technology. And the Zohar compares it to the days of Noah. It says that just as in the 600th year of Noah's life, the flood began and the, the waters from above uh, started raining down and the floodgates, the wellsprings from below also uh, began to rise up, so too in the year 5600, which corresponds to, on the secular calendar to, not, to excuse me, 1840, that the wellsprings, the floodgates will open up. Now, that doesn't mean a flood in the physical sense. It means a flood in the, in the spiritual sense. The mystics teach that the floodgates from above mean that Torah will be disseminated and, and released in a, in a way unparalleled in the, as it was in the past and that technology will increase first at a little trickle and then a little bit more and a little bit more until it'll be an unstoppable raging deluge. You know, when I think about world history, it's, it's interesting to, to note sort of the, the transformation of how Torah and in particular technology, science and technology, have sort of developed and integrated themselves into world consciousness. After the death of Archimedes, which was in 200, around 200 BCE, advancements in science took quite some time to start back up. Until, until around the 1500s with Copernicus and Galileo, scientific discovery was relatively limited. In the late 1600s and early 1700s, Sir Isaac Newton solidified the work of his predecessors and encapsulated the primary pillars of science into distinct fundamental laws using mathematics. The mid-1700s saw the Industrial Revolution sweep across Europe and then peak in the mid-1800s when it spread to the United States as well. So this period saw unprecedented growth in inventions and technology. So beginning at 1840, there is a, the real floodgates started to open technologically, which flowed and only expanded as we entered into the 20th century as well. Let's zero in on the 20th century for a moment. The 20th century, something began to happen that is basically miraculous. New theories and approaches to looking at the universe were initiated that transformed the way that mankind saw space and time, mind and matter. As the decades progressed after 1900 on the, on the secular calendar, there was an explosion of knowledge and, and an explosion of technological advances as well. You know, from the Garden of Eden until the year 1900, the main mode of transportation was a horse and buggy, like King David and Julius Caesar. You could have taken anybody out from, from the times of King David or the times of Julius Caesar and dropped them in the year 1000 and the year 1500, and the culture shock that they would experience would be fairly limited. From 1900, we saw the invention of the automobile, 
followed by the airplane and the jet plane until finally, 69 years later, well, 60 years later, rocket ships and eventually the space shuttle. Communications also spread. It became, uh, it went from the telegraph, then to the telephone, then to the cellular phone, then to Skype, until now a person can literally talk to anyone, anywhere in the world from their smartphone. Medical research is moving so fast, is progressing so fast, that by the time a book is written and goes to print, the information has already become obsolete. This century saw animals cloned, surgeries performed uh, through lasers and robots, and operations carried out on a fetus while still in its mother's womb. The trend continues nowadays at an even faster rate. It says that one week's worth of New York Times that's printed nowadays has more information in it that, than a person in the 1800s was exposed to in their entire life. Additionally, it says that this year alone, that there will be four exobytes of new and unique information uh, that will be generated, which is more than the sum total of all information generated in the first 5,000 years of world history combined. So we can see, as the Zohar predicted, that it, starting in the year 5600, 1840, was a time where the floodgates really opened. In fact, it's interesting to note that Pulitzer Prize winning commentator George Will published in Newsweek magazine that the year 1820 begins the modern era, an era distinct from all of history in the past. We said that one of the goals of Mashiach is that the natural will reflect the supernatural which means that as Mashiach nears, gets, gets nearer, that science itself, the study of nature, will even reveal some Jewish or spiritual concepts as well. Relativity, quantum mechanics, the uncertainty principle, and the anthropic principle are just a glimmer of how we see that taking place, how we see that merge coming together. The scientific discoveries are the lower waters that are mentioned in the Zohar, the upper waters are the flood of Torah knowledge that has burst forth over the past few centuries and began to proliferate at an exponential level. The purpose of the world was created to make it a dwelling place for the Almighty, and this is achieved that when the coarsest creation, when nature itself, will reveal the supernatural. As time progresses near the year 6000, Torah Insights too will become able to penetrate in ways and spread across the world in ways that they had never been done before, to all the lowest levels that they had been unable to reach in the previous generation. In fact, the proliferation of Torah can actually be seen right now as we speak. 